Hey guys, it's Medicosis Perfectionalis, where medicine makes perfect sense, helping medical students, nursing students, pharmacy students get their head out of their collective sphincters one student at a time. We continue our anesthesiology playlist. In the previous video, we have learned how to manage the airway. It's time today to talk about regional anesthesia. So let's get started. This is my anesthesiology playlist. Please watch these videos in order. Today is video number seven. As we have discussed before, anesthesia is not the same as analgesia. You can say that analgesia is part of the anesthesia. Analgesia is a subset of anesthesia. Every time you have anesthesia, like general anesthesia, you will have analgesia with it. But I can give you a pain medication. Pain medication will make you analgesic. Yeah, no pain. However, you're still conscious. Oh, yeah. So just because I have analgesia doesn't necessarily mean that I have anesthesia. Let's start by answering the question of the previous video. Should I pre-medicate the patient in order to prevent aspiration? The answer is unequivocally, absolutely no. No, you do not, because the overwhelming majority of patients are at very, 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 very low risk of aspiration syndrome. Anesthesia care phases. There is preoperative, there is intraoperative, and there is postoperative, and we have talked about that before. Anesthesia is general, regional, or local. Regional, which is today's topic, is neuraxial, limb, or others. Neuraxial, why neuro? Because we're talking about the nervous system here, okay? Why axial? Because the spinal cord is in the axis, is in the center, the middle of your body. It's in the median plane. Okay. And then we divide the neuraxial blocks into spinal and epidural. The epidural is further subdivided into thoracic epidural, lumbar epidural, and caudal epidural. In caudal, you usually go through the sacral hiatus. In this video, we'll talk about spinal and epidural. In the upcoming videos, we'll talk about limb blocks. In the good old days, which were not so good, regional anesthesia used to be called conduction anesthesia. It's important to know whence we came so that we may understand where the flip we're going. Some person once said, we do not live in the past, but the past in us. But medicosis says anatomy does not live in embryology, but embryology lives in anatomy. Wow, this was so deep. Honestly, I have no idea what the flip this means. Let's review some embryology, fertilization, then cleavage, then blastulation, then implantation, bilaminar embryo, trilaminar embryo. What is bilaminar epiblast, hypoblast? What is trilaminar endoderm, mesoderm, ectoderm? The ectoderm in the third week will give you your nervous system. Under the influence of what? Of the primitive streak. As you know, you have four types of tissue. Nerve tissue comes from the ectoderm. Your lovely nervous system with either CNS or PNS. Central, peripheral, central, brain and spinal cord. Peripheral, cranial nerves, spinal nerves. The spinal cord has many segments. Cervical, thoracic, lumbar, sacral and coccygeal. Your beautiful ectoderm will give you surface ectoderm for the epidermis of your skin and neuroectoderm for central nervous system, neural tube, and peripheral nervous system, neural crest. If you want to learn more about this, check out my video titled Neurulation in my biology playlist. All right, ectoderm, you gave me the brain, the spinal cord, as well as cranial nerves, spinal nerves. All right, how about mesodermal notochord? The notochord will give you the nucleus pulposus of the intervertebral disc. So here is a vertebra, here is another vertebra, a third vertebra. Between them you have what? Between a vertebra and the next vertebra you have an intervertebral disc. The intervertebral disc is made of two parts. The outer part called annulus fibrosus and the inner part called the nucleus pulposus. If this is anterior and this is posterior, you see that the spinal cord is behind the vertebral bodies. Here is your epidermis of the skin and here is your neural tube and neural crest. Neural tube will become brain and spinal cord. Neural crest will become cranial nerves and spinal nerves. Got some segmentation action going? And phew, look at this. Look at this beauty. Very beautiful. Neural tube, that's your spinal cord here. And then you have the neural crest became the spinal nerves. What's the name of this beautiful canal in the middle? Spinal canal. How about the vertebral canal? No, no, no. The vertebral canal is a bony canal and this surrounds everything here. So the spinal cord itself with its roots lie inside the vertebral canal. However, if I cut the spinal cord transversely inside the spinal cord itself, there is the spinal canal which contains cerebrospinal fluid. That's the spinal cord. We can do the same thing for the brain. In this case, the neural tube will be the brain itself. The neural crest will be cranial nerves. And the cavity inside the brain is 
the ventricles containing CSF. See, medicine makes so much sense once you understand what the flip you're talking about. So here's your brain, prosencephalon, mesencephalon, and rhombencephalon. Let's look at the inside. At the inside, you have cerebrospinal fluid inside these cavities called ventricles. It's made here in the lateral ventricles. Who makes the cerebrospinal fluid? Okay, ready? Ependymal cells of the choroid plexus, which lines the ventricles. Okay, cerebrospinal fluid is here, lateral ventricles. And then we'll go from the lateral ventricles into the third ventricles. How did you go from here to here? Through the interventricular foramina of Monroe. Next, we are here in the third ventricle. Nice. Let's go to the fourth ventricle. How do you go? Through the cerebral aqueduct of Sylvius. The same doofus who discovered the Sylvian fissure, but that's a story for another time. And then after the fourth ventricle, where would you go? All right, I have a median opening and I have two lateral openings. Median in the midline, what's that? This is the foramen of Majande. And then you have two lateral foramen of Lushka. So lateral is Lushka, but median is Majande. Nice, and then where will the CSF go? The CSF will go all around your brain. Nice. Where? Where is it? Here. It's in the subarachnoid space. All right. And all around your spinal cord. Where is it here? In the subarachnoid space. Also, it's in your brain, called ventricles, and inside your spinal cord, called spinal canal. Here is the spinal cord. As you see, posterior horn, lateral horn, anterior horn of the gray matter. Okay. Lateral horn will give you autonomic fibers. If you are thoracolumbar, this is sympathetic. If you are sacral, this is parasympathetic. All right, in epidural or spinal anesthesia, where the flip do we dip the needle? You stick the needle into, okay, listen to this song. To keep the spinal cord alive, keep the needle between L3 and 5, oh la la. So between L3 and L5, we are in the lumbar area. Yes, do you think lumbar has sympathetic or parasympathetic fibers? Of course it has sympathetic. Okay, and don't forget that sympathetic preganglionic were type B fibers, but the postganglionic were type C fibers. Oh yeah. Type C is the thinnest, type B is the second thinnest, which means they get affected by the anesthetic before others. And that's why one of the side effects of epidural or spinal anesthesia is hypotension. Why? Because you will affect the sympathetic earlier. And then what? When you affect the sympathetic, you cannot constrict your arteries because you have lost alpha-1 stimulation. You also cannot constrict your veins. Oh, so this will decrease the venous return. Oh, and this will decrease the cardiac output. Oh yeah, because if there is less input to the heart, there will be less output from the heart. Well, no duh. So hypotension is a common complication of neuraxial block. The meninges, you have the dura mater, arachnoid mater, and pia mater. By the way, it's mater, not matter. Matter is just a substance. But mater is mother. So, if your biological mother has abandoned you in order to go get a pedicure, just remember that you have three mothers hugging you 24-7. The dura mater, arachnoid mater, and the most loving, tender, pia mater. Where the flip is the cerebrospinal fluid? Oh, it is in the subarachnoid space. Where the flip is that? Between the arachnoid and the pia. Dura is the outermost, pia is the innermost. Between the arachnoid and the pia, you have the cerebrospinal fluid. Where is epidural anesthesia? Here, outside of the dura. Where is the spinal anesthesia? Here, in the subarachnoid space between the arachnoid and the pia. By the way, the arachnoid mata is a pharmacological barrier. So the epidural anesthetic will not reach the subarachnoid space. Unless, of course, you are a doofus and you have penetrated the dura and the arachnoid by mistake. Oh, wow, look at that. This is so beautiful. Frank Netter is getting jealous. Here is the back of the patient. And let's go. First layer, skin. Then subcutaneous tissue. Go deeper. Supraspinous ligament. And then interspinous ligament. And then don't say infraspinous because you will look stupid. It's called ligamentum flavum of vertebra. And then epidural space. Oh, epidural is above the dura. No kidding. After the dura, you have what? Subdural. Mm -hmm. And then arachnoid mater and then the subarachnoid space which has the cerebrospinal fluid. Pia mater, the pia is hugging the spinal cord. And then you continue, pia, subarachnoid, arachnoid, subdural, and dural, because they are it's like a circle, it's a circle, baby. And then you will hit the posterior longitudinal ligament, 
And then you have vertebra. See, here's the vertebral body, body, body. Between them, you have the intervertebral disc. The green part is the outer annulus fibrosus. The gray central part is the nucleus pulposus. And then after that, anteriorly, you have the anterior longitudinal ligament. I want to leave a legacy to this world. I do not want anyone to remember Gray's anatomy, maybe as an afterthought. Now let's get a lovely needle and inject a local anesthetic into the epidural space, aka epidural anesthesia. Look at this, look at this, look, wow, I'm in the epidural space. So I've pierced the skin, subcutaneous tissue, supraspinous, interspinous, ligamentum flavum, and now I'm in the epidural. Now let's perform a spinal anesthesia. Wow, wow, ooh, look at that, look, at, wow, we are in the subarachnoid space which has cerebrospinal fluid. It's easy to detect this because you can just let the needle drip and it will drip some cerebrospinal fluid. How do I know that this is the cerebrospinal fluid and not the saline that was in the freaking needle? Easy, the saline that you injected was at room temperature. Oh, but the cerebrospinal fluid is going to be warmer because the patient's body temperature is warmer than the room temperature, you freaking doofus. So let these drops drop onto your forearm and feel them. If they are cold, that's your saline. If they are warm, that's the patient's cerebrospinal fluid. Congratulations, you have entered the promised land. Spinal is in the subarachnoid. Epidural is in the epidural. Socrates said that the best way to learn is asking questions. All right, Q&A, let's go. Is the patient conscious during the neuraxial block? The answer is yes, most of the time. Can I sedate like add benzos, opiate? Yeah, you can. Some, in many cases, you can put the patient to sleep. Do I need to add a neuromuscular blocker such as vicuronium? Absolutely not, because it is included in the package. It's part of the deal. It's part of your injection. When you inject the local anesthetic, it will paralyze the patient's muscle. Because you are around the spinal cord, you absolute dork. What comes out of the spinal cord? Um, motor fibers. Yep, you will block them. Can neuraxial nerve block cause permanent nerve injury? It's possible, but it's very unlikely. Be careful because many patients will exaggerate this. And here is how it goes down. Hey, Karen, how are you? Welcome to the clinic. Hi, doctor. How are you? You won't believe what happened to me. The bastard. Who is the bastard? The anesthesiologist doctor. He paralyzed me. Now I'm paralyzed from the waist downwards. Then how come you are wiggling your toes, Karen? Well, I'm not paralyzed in the toes. I'm only paralyzed in the thigh and the legs, but my feet are fine. This is anatomically impossible, Karen, because the lumbosacral plexus starts in the spinal cord and then it goes downwards. So if your feet are fine, it means that everything before your feet is also fine. So you're saying that I am lying? I'm not saying anything. Anatomy is what anatomy does. I don't have the luxury of creating the universe on day one. How dare you? So the permanent nerve damage can happen, but it's extremely unlikely. What's the first ligament to be pierced by your freaking needle? The supraspinous ligament. What happens if my epidural needle hit the artery of Adam Kiewix? Oh my goodness, the patient can suffer from anterior spinal artery syndrome. Pain and temperature sensation, they're gone. Crude touch sensation, gone. Motor functions, gone. How about the fine touch vibration and proprioception? They are preserved because these are in the posterior and not the anterior part of the spinal cord if you remember your neuroanatomy. Do you remember the phenomenon of time synergism? Yep, adding the local anesthetic and epinephrine together. All right, why do you add epinephrine to the local anesthetic? For many reasons, because it's a vasoconstrictor, it decreases the release of substance B, so it decreases pain. Also, when you vasoconstrict, you decrease the absorption of the local anesthetic. The local anesthetic is gonna stay in place and this will keep it localized and it increases the duration of the action of local anesthetic. Also, when you constrict the vessel, less local anesthetic will escape through the systemic circulation, which means less systemic toxicity and less bleeding from the procedure because of the vasoconstriction. So can I add epinephrine to my local anesthetic during neuraxial block? Yes, you can. What if my patient has any condition that increases their intra-abdominal pressure? Example, abdominal mass, abdominal tumor, ascites, etc. What's going to happen? Uh, any of these conditions will press on the inferior vena cava in the abdomen. Okay. Any vein that wants to drain into the inferior vena cava can kiss my calcaneus. It's not going to happen because the vein is congested. Oh, so congestion here will lead to congestion here. What the flip is that? That's your internal vertebral venous plexus. Oh, so while your needle is trying to go into the patient's back, 
the needle is more likely to hit a vessel because the vessels are congested. Why didn't your freaking anatomy professor tell you these stories? Because he's woke. Medicine makes so much sense if explained properly. Anatomy is boring, but clinically oriented anatomy is the best thing since sliced bread. What kind of local anesthetic solution should I inject into the patient's epidural space or subarachnoid space? You have three options, a hyperbaric, isobaric or a hypobaric solution. What's the difference? Hyperbaric, we are, we mean it's not the pressure, it's the density. And in physics, density is mass over volume, if you remember. So hyperbaric is literally heavier than the CSF and isobaric is like the same density as the CSF, hyperbaric is lower density. Which one is the most commonly used? Hyperbaric. Although it depends on the surgery and the position of the patient. The rule of thumb is that you want the anesthetic to be away from the surgeon. So let's say that this is a perineal surgery. So here's the patient's feet. All right, nice, 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 nice. And the patient is in the jackknife position because it's a perineal surgery. The surgeon is working here, all right, in this area. Where do you want the anesthetic to be away from the surgeon? I want the anesthetic to be floating on the surface of the patient's back here, inside. Not deep because it's closer to the surgery. I want it to be away from the surgery. So in this situation, you may consider a hypobaric solution because it's gonna float. Your thoracic spinous processes look like this. They are pointing downwards. However, if you go to the lumbar area, they are pointing outwards like this. And that's why the midline approach is usually the most used. But in this case, you might try paramedian, which means you go lateral and you go downwards in order to be able to hit the space. Surface anatomy, very important. Now get your beautiful head and touch your hair and go down, 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 down your neck until you reach something that's very prominent. Yeah, a prominent bone. This is C7, baby, in the midline, of course. And then you go down, okay, the lower edge or the lower border of the scapula is T7. Nice. How about the last rib, L1? Nice. How about the iliac crest, L4? How about the posterior superior iliac spine? This is S2. Where should I put the needle? To keep the spinal cord alive, keep the needle between L3 and 5, because before L3, most people have their spinal cord ending about L1 to L2 level, so you're gonna be below this. There is a difference between the spinal segment, here inside the spinal cord, vertebral body, which is a bone, and the dermatome, which is skin segment. All right, spinal segment. For example, look at this, look at the C1. All right, C1 goes above C1 bony vertebra. Nice. How about C2 above C2 vertebra? How about C3 nerve above C3 nerve vertebra? But since you have eight nerve segments here, but only seven vertebral bodies, oh, where do you think C8 is gonna go below C7? which means above T1. Therefore, the T1 nerve is below the T1 vertebral body. T2 nerve is below T2 and then etc, etc, etc. So the vertebral body and the spinal segment are not always the same. Moreover, as you go down, the nerves start to go down and the exit. Go down before the exit, go down before the exit. So the L4 skin dermato might be here. However, the L4 spinal segment is up there. So they are not at the same level. As a general rule, the level of the sympathetic block is more cephalic, which means upward, than the level of the sensory block, which is more cephalic than the level of the motor block. Spinal versus epidural anesthesia, let's go. Indications, when should I use spinal? If the surgery is in the lower abdomen, pelvis, perineum, lower limbs. Do not use it if it's upper abdominal or thoracic surgery. You might go with general anesthetic and not spinal anesthesia. All right, epidural, same thing. Surgery in the lower abdomen, pelvis, perineum, lower limbs. Also, it's used in combination with general anesthesia. You can use general and epidural together. During labor and delivery, continuous epidural for pain management. Post-operatively, doctor, the surgery is gone, but I have severe pain. You can give epidural to manage the pain. Contraindications, of course, if the patient refuses the procedure, you don't do it. Bleeding diathesis, this is not an absolute contraindication. There is guidelines and it, it's complicated. Infection in the area that you will inject into. Intracranial hypertension, because if I have intracranial hypertension, you should be removing some of my CSF, not adding more to my CSF, you freaking doofus. Paresthesia, upper, etc., and the same things here. If the patient started complaining of paresthesia, while you're injecting the local anesthetic, you stop. You stop the procedure immediately because paresthesia means you have hit a freaking nerve. 
Which position should I put the patient in? There is lateral decubitus, there is sitting, there is prone. The jackknife position is used for perineal surgery. Epidural, same positions. Patient's positioning is more relevant here for spinal, not so relevant in epidural. Where should I stick the needle to keep the spinal cord alive? Keep the needle between L3 and 5. If it's caudal epidural, you will go through the sacral hiatus. What are we injecting? Local anesthetic, not general, local. So pharmacologically speaking, you have a general anesthetic and a local anesthetic. There is no such thing as a regional anesthetic agent. We're injecting local here. Where are you injecting it? Subarachnoid space, epidural space. Spinal takes less time. Here, the procedure takes more time. The patient will experience less discomfort with spinal, more discomfort with epidural. You know why? Because it takes more time. No, duh. This needs less anesthetic, this needs more. And that's why you need to be very careful and not to pierce the dura. Because if you pierce the dura mater and you're injecting tons of local anesthetic, you can cause permanent neurological damage, you freaking doofus. Sensory and motor blocks has a stronger block, of course, because you're deeper. Which one is easier? Here, just keep pushing until CSF comes out of the needle. Any doofus can do it, but epidural, it requires a pro. Segmental block can be achieved with epidural. You can fine-tune the epidural, yeah, because when you change the concentration, this will easily change the intensity of the block. Easily is the key word here. Do you need titration spinal? Ah, probably not. Epidural, yup. Long-term administration is easier with epidural. Which one depends on the natural, normal curvature of your spine? Spinal, of course, spinal with spine. Of course, the normal curvature is, normally you have some lumbar lordosis, but sacral kyphosis, thoracic kyphosis, cervical lordosis. Complications, the risk of post-dural punctural headache is higher with spinal, lower with epidural. The risk of hypotension is higher because you're deeper, of course. Complications of neuraxial block. What are the complications of spinal anesthesia? 1 through 10. Hypotension, which may ca might cause shivering. Why hypotension? Because you block the sympathetic. You block the arteriolar constriction and the venous constriction, which will decrease venous return and cardiac output. Hypoventilation, backache, bradycardia to the point of asystole. Because when you block the sympathetic, the parasympathetic will be unopposed. You might consider giving atropine here. Post-dural puncture headache, we'll talk about that soon. You're in retention because you blocked my sensory fibers. I cannot feel my bladder distending. Remember the micturition reflex. Nausea, vomiting, itching, neurological complications, and total spinal anesthesia. What are the complications of epidural anesthesia? 1 through 10 plus. You might puncture the dura like a doofus and this is going to be dangerous because you are using lots of local anesthetic if you inject this to the subarachnoid space instead of the epidural space you can cause permanent neurological damage don't do it epidural abscess epidural hematoma nerve injury or permanent neurological damage Post-dural puncture headache, more common in younger patients than older ones. The larger the needle, the greater the risk of headache. Why does the headache happen? Because you punctured a hole in the dura, which will cause loss of some cerebrospinal fluid, which will lead your brain to sink in place. Your brain will be displaced downwards, causing headache. If the brain sinks too much, it might tear some of the bridging veins, which can lead to subdural hematoma. When does the headache happen? About 14 to 18 hours after you pierce the dura mater. The headache is usually frontal or occipital or both. You can also find ocular disturbances, most commonly diplopia, especially due to the abducens nerve injury because this is the one affected whenever you have any problems with the brain sinking, change in pressure. Cranial nerve 6 gets hit like crazy photophobia and seeing spots in front of me. Treatment, conservative management, bed rest, fluids, pain medications, and then you give the patients caffeine. So should I run to Starbucks and give him a $9 cup of nitro cold brew? Oh, shut up. I'm talking about intravenous caffeine injection. Run to Starbucks. Oh, give me a break. Do you want some mocha drizzle with that too? Get your head out of your sphincter. And the last is blood patch. What the flip is that? You take some of the patient's blood and you inject it into the patient's cerebrospinal fluid. Can I give him some of my own blood because I love my patient so much? Shut up, you can trigger an immunological reaction. Question of the day, who is prone to aspiration syndrome? Coming up next, limb blocks.
If you like this video, you will love my acid-based disturbances course. It's the best course that I've ever created. Comes with 30 videos, 25 cases, notes, perfectionalist, ultimate notebook, and mind map. Available at medicosisperfectionalist.com. Thank you so much for watching. Please subscribe, hit the bell, and click on the join button. You can support me here or here. Go to my website to download my premium courses. Thank you for watching. As always, be safe, stay happy, study hard. This is Medicosis Perfectionalist, where medicine makes perfect sense.